Okay, well, I'd like us, if we could, again, to look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13. We're going to read from verse 17 to the end of the chapter. Uh, most likely, we will also get into chapter 14 this morning. And the topic before us is false prophetesses and phony elders. So everything, everything about this morning is phony and false, uh, except the word of God, which is true. But uh, that's our theme before us. I want to begin uh, again in verse 17. It says this way, Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe! to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will you save the souls alive that come unto you? And will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and save the souls alive that should not live? by your lying to my people that hear your lies. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Therefore he shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So this is a wall pronounced on these false prophetesses. And we mentioned last time that there were indeed some legitimate prophetesses uh, in the land of Israel. Um, we mentioned different ones, Miriam and Deborah, uh, and of course, Holder. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, as well as always when you have the true, you also have the false. Now, the enemy is good at imitating, and so you have these false prophetesses. And so uh, th there's a, and it's kind of a, a sad thing, uh, but uh, uh, he, his message to them is very similar to that to the, the male prophets. And so first of all, uh, he mentions uh, how they prophesy, just like the men. He, he says, which prophesy out of their own heart, prophesy thou against them. So they're not prophesying from God. It's out of their own hearts, out of their own imaginations, out of their own evil hearts, do they prophesy. And again, just as the men, he is told to prophesy against them. And so much similarity with the opening section that we looked at last time. However, uh, where there's significant changes, uh, there's... A description of their activities. And uh, one thing that we would suggest is that uh, they're, they're really not prophetesses in the strictest sense of the word. They're more sorceresses. Uh, that would be a, a, perhaps a better way of describing it. In fact, God pronounces a definite woe against them uh, because of their evil ways. Verse 18, uh, say, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the women, and then begins to describe some of their activities. And uh, we'll look at what they were involved with. But I want to suggest to you that basically uh, these were sorceresses that were involved in magic arts. And this, uh, for Jewish people, this is a very serious thing. Of course, we, we have examples of it in the New Testament. We have uh, uh, Simon the Sorcerer. We have Elimas. Uh, so, so there are different individuals who were Jews that got involved in the dark arts, but it was strictly forbidden for them. Uh, it was something that was more common amongst Gentiles. And so in Deuteronomy 18, I want to just kind of give you the basis here, the background where the Lord God uh, clearly prohibits 
this fascination uh, with the powers of darkness. It says in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 18, it says, When thou art come into the land uh, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times, to diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. So the Canaanite kind of religion that was there in the land before the nation of Israel came in was very influenced uh, by witchcraft, uh, by divination, uh, by enchanters, uh, all of these things, and kind of what we would, would call the dark arts, really, the, the occultic practices. And it is uh, sad, really. It's uh, it's true in our day. I remember when we first were in the work of the Lord back in the UK, we were involved in tent meetings uh, in a part of my native Yorkshire. And uh, as we were having these meetings, uh, it was brought to our attention. There were 43 witches' covens in that part of the, the county, 43 witches' covens. And uh, actually, they were even sacrificing uh, animals and stuff like that uh, to kind of put a hex on our work, which is amazing. This is kind of supposedly modern Britain. And uh, it just shows really how uh, societies that turn their back on God pretty soon go into this occultic kind of world. And so certainly that's what's behind what is going on here. And so it's most likely these were really sorcerers who claimed to be prophetesses, uh, but were deeply involved in magical arts and also uh, manufactured uh, magic charms to ward off uh, various uh, evils. And so he begins to describe some of the things. And so he says in verse 18, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the woman, uh, the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature. So pillows and kerchiefs, these are kind of interesting things. Of course, there have been various explanations given. And part of the reason it's so difficult to interpret this chapter is this is the only place in the whole of Scripture where this is used. And so you can't compare scripture with scripture to try and get some understanding of what's really going on here. So there are various uh, explanations that have been given. I'll mention a few of them, not too many, uh, but then we'll uh, land hopefully on a suitable explanation. So some of the some uh, expositors take them to figuratively to mean uh, smooth and soft things. And so you get the idea pillows. Uh, speaks of comfort and ease and all the rest of it. And so the idea is that these so-called prophetesses, instead of telling the reality, the reality is that they're surrounded by the Babylonians, that they're about to enter into siege, and the future is not so bright. But they were basically uh, giving a message which was smooth and had soft things, which the hearers uh, would uh, put their confidence in. Uh, these false messages and their faith in that uh, they had nothing to look forward to, uh, but a life of comfort and ease. Others say the pillows were cushions upon which the prophetesses would rest to show their confidence and faith, indicating the peace and calm to those who received their uh, advice and messages. So you can get the idea of a, a woman laying on a pillow and then giving this message uh, and it's almost conveying this message that if you believe what I say, uh, you're going to experience comfort, peace, everything's going to be fine. Perhaps the most common explanation, and the one that I would say is the most reasonable, is that uh, these pillows were really um, amulets or good look charms worn on the body, uh, maybe strips of, of cloth 
uh, padded cloth put on the arms or something like that, uh, kerchiefs and no doubt uh, a veil uh, which was made to fit every inquirer. And so that's a most likely explanation. Again, it's very hard to uh, to nail it down. And it says uh, also the prophet not only accused them of using these uh, various uh, things, amulets and stuff like that, uh, but it also for hunting souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people? And so hunting souls, it's kind of interesting that they were they were looking for victims to catch them. And the, the picture is like birds in a trap in order to um, basically uh, get them in there in, in under their spell. And so hunt the souls of my people. Will you save the souls alive that come unto you? And so basically uh, they, they claimed that they had the power of life and death over those that came to them. Uh, they, they, they believed they had the capacity uh, to save them alive. And so uh, we, we do read this, that in Babylonia, Jewish women were selling charms and spells. Uh, they were ready to do anything for even a small reward, uh, putting a curse on the innocent and promising a long life and safe life for wrongdoing. <laughs> so that's what they, uh, they uh, are saying that they're doing. Now, verse 19, it says, and will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread uh, to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? So uh, handfuls of barley, pieces of bread was the price uh, to traffic in lies. And again, remember that there's 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 a possibility of a coming famine, and it would seem that these uh, these women, these women sorcerers, uh, that the price for their services was uh, handfuls of barley, pieces of bread. Uh, again, uh, that's that's basically the price that they would sell their lies for. And in the process, they were polluting the Lord's name because they were they were acting as if they were serving him, but their power came from another source. And so in a very real sense, they were polluting the name of the Lord by their activities. Uh, when things that they said didn't come true, uh, they were making the Lord out to be the deceiver and the liar. And so it's a very, we said before, it's a very serious thing to ever speak in the name of the Lord especially if you're not speaking in the name of the Lord, if you're speaking out of your own hearts, but what you're saying is associating your message with him and therefore polluting uh, his testimony, his, his name. Uh, and so that's exactly what is going on here. So it says in verse 20, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt uh, to make them fly. So once again, uh, like their male counterparts, they hear these very uh, scary words from the Lord. I am against you. And the Lord is saying, I'm against your schemes. God would deliver his people from such sorceries. Their divination gave false hope to the wicked and also condemned the just. The practice of false prophetesses and prophets hunting souls has sadly not ended. Those who seduce others with false words, with magic charms, with special clothing, and other things are still very active today. And uh, sadly, uh, in our world that supposedly is becoming more secular, at the same time, there's more fascination with the occult and the occultic things than there has ever been. And one of the uh, growth areas uh, in religion in North America is what we call wicker and witchcraft and all of these things. And so what we can say is uh, these kind of women have not gone away. Uh, in fact, it's, it's the kind of the new spirituality of our secular age. 
And uh, it's amazing how many people are involved in this kind of thing uh, for different reasons. They have charms and spells and all the rest of it. And they say, oh, it's always for good things. It's to get things you need and all the rest of it. But on the other hand, if somebody crosses you, it's also to put people under hexes as well. And so uh, what's interesting is that the, the women are very much behind this. And I want to say this, that the Bible is clear that there are many wonderful, excellent women, but there are also women who are very vulnerable to Satan's deception. We know that from the Garden of Eden, and we can certainly see here that there are women that have been deceived by the evil one. And we can certainly see that throughout history, uh, how easy it is for women to be led astray. We've got our Mary Baker eddies of our day with Christian science, which is neither Christian nor scientific. Uh, we have others uh, that have been involved in these things, Ellen G. White and the Seventh-day Adventists, all of these women who've been led astray. And so, uh, again, here we have an example once more of this happening. And um, tragically, haunting souls, looking for victims, looking for hapless victims that will swallow their lies. And, of course, the Lord condemns it. And he is going to tear them from your arms. He, the Lord is going to deal with these uh, women very directly. Uh, he is going to, uh, the, the birds that they capture, so to speak, it's all this picture. Uh, they want to fly, but you, you're holding them down. He's going to, he's going to deliver them uh, so that they can indeed be free from you, free from your snare, snare. And so verse 21, it says, Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and you shall know that I am the Lord. God would strip them of their charms and amulets and then take his people back to their land, leaving these evil women behind to die. God promised that through the defeat of the female prophets and his rescue of those who were prey in their hands, he would reveal himself. You shall know that I am the Lord, that kind of refrain that runs through uh, the book of Ezekiel. And so then he says in verse 22, he says, Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. So again, just as every false prophet, both men and women, have some terrible effects of their work. And it's, it, it brings sadness to the heart of the righteous and it strengthens the hand of the wicked. And that's exactly what was going on with the uh, work of these false prophetesses. The wicked would not turn from their wicked ways. They're, they're actually, uh, as it were, strengthened, emboldened in it through the ministry of these women. And so, again, what a, what a great tragedy. And any teaching is false that basically uh, undermines righteousness and, on the other hand, in, encourages people to continue uh, unrepentant in their wicked ways. It clearly is false, and that certainly was true uh, of these women. And even promising them life, and basically they're under divine judgment. God is going to judge the, and and these women are saying it's okay. Continue on the way you're living. It's all right. It's not going to happen. Uh, you're going to live. Uh, you're not going to die. The righteous were heartbroken by hearing this message, and of course, isn't it true today? Are we not heartbroken when we we hear uh, abominations? Uh, spoken of as normal and natural and acceptable in our own culture, even by people in high office and all the rest of it. And they say these perversions are okay and perfectly acceptable. Doesn't that make the hearts of the righteous sad? Uh, because these people have been confirmed in their wickedness rather than confronted and brought to repentance where they need to be. And so this is exactly what these women were doing. They were confirming people in their sinful ways and as a result, breaking the heart of the righteous and discouraging the righteous. And really what was needed in the nation was genuine repentance. And uh, these false prophets, these false prophetesses, they're militating against that through their false lies. Verse 23, therefore you shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations 
for I will deliver my people out of your hand and you shall know that I am the Lord. God put promised to put an end to the false prophets. Their visions uh, were futility and their ceremonies were not worship, but divination. And God promised to deliver his people from their deception. And so, again, this is the promise of God. Uh, what is unmistakable is that they degraded the name of the Lord by linking it with the superstitions and magical practices that they were involved in. And so, again, what a warning uh, to these uh, uh, phony and uh, false prophetesses, which leads us into chapter 14. And this is uh, very pertinent because it's talking about phony shepherds, fake shepherds, fake elders. Now, again, just to remind ourselves, this um, section we're entering into in chapter 14 really forms part of a larger section from chapter 13 through 17. Uh, we've seen the unfaithful prophets in chapter 13. We're going to see the unseen idolatry. And the idea is that these elders come showing an interest as if they want to hear from God, but they still have idols in their hearts. So unfaithful prophets, unseen idolatry. Uh, chapter 15, we're going to see a useless vine. <laughs> and then chapter 16, an unfaithful wife. And then in chapter 17, unreliable promises. So again, it's just kind of hearkening onto the fact that now, there's so much deception going on. Uh, people are not believing the truth. And so uh, people, are, why God is to judge them. This is behind all of these sections. So in verse one through eight, the futility of expecting God to speak to them, or even we might say to us, while we persist in idolatry of the heart. And so it's very sobering. It's kind of interesting how God says certain things. He's going to say here that don't expect to hear from God if you're not already responding to what he's already said in his word. You can't expect to hear something new from God if you're not serious about obeying what he's already shown you. If you've already got if you've got idols in your heart, it's going to be like having a lot of wax in your ears. It's going to prevent you from hearing from God. And so that's a but there's another aspect too, isn't it? Uh, Psalm 66, 18 says, if I re not re regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So here's another side. Don't expect God to hear from us if we're holding on to iniquity in our heart. So it's kind of like a, a twofold uh, equation here. Don't expect to hear from God if you're still holding on to idolatry in your heart. And don't expect God to hear from you if you regard iniquity in your heart. In other words, the heart is really important, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's the uh, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. Uh, the heart is the key to this whole understanding of this. So notice uh, as we look at verse 1, it says, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me so once again the elders visit him we saw this in chapter 8 where they came to ezekiel's house uh, in verse 1 came to pass the sixth year the sixth month fifth day of the month as i sat in my house the elders of judah sat before me the hand of the lord god fell there upon me so once again the elders are coming to his house maybe the hope in their hearts is hearing uh, some kind of uh, oracle uh, about the length of their exile, maybe expectation that they soon be going back, or news of affairs uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, they they want to hear from him. They want to hear a message. Also, it's interesting that we could say this, that at least it appears that the prophet is being acknowledged and his statue, statue, uh, stature as a true messenger of God is being recognized. The fact that they're coming and sitting before him shows that they recognize he is a man with a message from God, a man who's in touch with God 
And like Jeremiah, a man who spoke from the mouth of God. By the way, let me just show you this lovely verse. It's, it's delightful in 2 Chronicles 36. And what a great compliment uh, given to Jeremiah. 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 12, it says, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And so well, isn't that wonderful to have that reputation, uh, somebody who speaks from the mouth of God. And what we're saying is Ezekiel had begun to get that reputation so that people came to listen to him. They knew that he was a man in touch with God. I wonder, uh, do people know that you're someone who's in touch with God, that there's, there's evidence in your life that you have a relationship with a living God? And that people uh, come and, and seek your advice or, or ask you to pray for them because they know that there's something real about your relationship. And so certainly this is true of Ezekiel. They come, they sit before him. Of course, uh, these elders were meant to be spiritual leaders of the nation, uh, men who should have tested the false prophets and enforced the Mosaic covenant upon the people. So just remind you who these people are, but here they come, and it says in verse 2, it says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face, should I be inquired of at all by them. So remember, Ezekiel was mute. So all they, although they came to see him, uh, we read in verse 2, the word of the Lord came unto him. He's powerless to answer them, any of their inquiries, unless the Lord spoke through him. And so as they sat before him, the word of the Lord comes to him. But what it does is it gives him something that he had no way of knowing. The condition of the heart of the people who are coming to inquire. Of course, this is what makes God God, the omniscience of God. Uh, he knows the conditions of the hearts of people. And so even though couldn't, you know, they come, they they maybe give in all sincerity. We want to, if you've got a message for us, we want to hear it. And yet inside, there's obviously idolatry deeply in their heart. And I want you to just notice that this is repeated several times in this opening section. Uh, we see it here in verse 3. Uh, they uh, said, these men have set up idols in their heart. We see it in verse 4. Uh, again, he says, therefore speak to them, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that sets up his idols in his heart. Verse uh, 7, again we see it. Uh, for every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart. So God, when God is repeating something, he's, there's a reason. He's telling us these people, they're coming, they're asking to hear from God, but actually their hearts are full of idolatry. In fact, verse 5 tells us the reason this is so serious. It says that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they're all estranged from me through their idols. So here's the problem with these idols. They cause people to become estranged from God. Instead of enjoying int intimacy with God, they become estranged from God because of these idols. So once again, aren't we reminded of the truth that's so often reiterated in the word of God? The Lord looketh on the heart man he looks on the outward appearance and by all outward appearance these elders look like they're serious to hear from god but god looks on the heart uh, the word of god is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart hebrews 4 12 uh, it reveals the true condition of, of the heart and it's good to ask ourselves isn't it when we read this it's so easy to say oh those those nasty, uh, you know, kind of men of Judah and all their ways and all the rest of it. But, you know, I think the Lord would be asking us a very serious question this morning. And that question is this, where's your heart? 
Does the Lord see something of an idol already in your heart? Because the Lord sees. We can't fool. We can fool others. We know how to play the game. Uh, we know how to impress others and give the impression of piety. But the Lord knows the condition of the heart, and He knows the idols that lurk there. And so it's good to ask ourselves, where's my heart today, this morning? Now, uh, like the elders that were mentioned in chapter 8 in Jerusalem, remember they were involved in idolatry when he got that uh, taken to uh, Jerusalem and to see the condition. And in chapter 8, uh, in verse 10 through 12, there were elders that were in the land uh, he said that went up and saw, verses 10 of uh, Ezekiel 8, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And so these elders of Israel, they, they're, they've got idols in the very house of God. And so here are the people who are already in captivity that group that had been taken on a previous wave and although uh, they may not have outwardly having idols there were still idols in their hearts they were still hankering after the idols uh, maybe they didn't have them in their houses anymore because they were in captivity or whatever but they were hankering after them and so the very asking of god uh, to speak to them was really an affront and an insult to God while ever their hearts were full of idolatry. You see, God doesn't want a divided heart. Uh, remember the Lord Jesus, when he summarized the commandments, he said, you should love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and all your strength. And so all your heart, not part of it, all your heart, a divided heart is something God does not want. Let me go back to 1 Kings 18 and uh, just uh, the contest on Mount Carmel and just a, a message that, that uh, the prophet gives, very powerful message and a message that we, we all need to be reminded of from time to time. It, and Elijah came to all the people and he said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people answered him, not a word. So here's the nation of Israel and their hearts are divided between the God of Israel and Baal. Which way do they go? Who are they going to, who are they going to give their allegiance to? And the Lord says through the, the uh, through James's epistle, James 1 verse 8, very powerful words, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's absolute instability. You want the Lord, you want the world. You want the Lord, you want your idols. You want the Lord, you want... And, and it just leads to a complete instability. The Lord doesn't want that. And, of course, we, we see this, this truth uh, of people coming to God, but they're drawing near to God but their hearts are elsewhere. Let me just read you from Isaiah 29. It's quoted by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 15 of the people of his generation, uh, that um, the, the religious leaders of his generation. But in Isaiah 29 and verse 13, we read these very sobering words. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Drawing near to God with your heart, with, with your lips, but your heart being far from him. And so it's very important, isn't it, to, to think of it. It's a very sobering little section that we're looking at today. Um, it's important for those who come to Scripture asking guidance from God and the message is this, no true direction can be given to those who have erected idols in their hearts. No true direction can be given to those who have erected idols in their hearts. If we really want to know the will of God, we must first surrender our hearts to complete allegiance to him. 
And then we can hear from him and expect direction from him. Of course, the New Testament has examples uh, that we know very well of people who looked spiritual on the outside, but had idols in their hearts. And just two that come to mind, we won't look them up, but you know them well. Uh, one is Ananias and Sapphira. They looked like they were giving tremendous devotion to the Lord in bringing the price of this land and all the rest of it, just like Barnabas had done. But they wanted the recognition of men, but they also had a covetousness in their hearts as well because they kept back part of the price of the land. Another one is the rich young ruler claimed that he was, um, you know, kind of fully obedient to the law of God. And yet he had a high idol in his heart. He didn't want to give up his riches. They meant so much to him. And so it's very easy for us to look and give all the appearance of spiritual keenness on the outside, but have hearts that are still captivated by idols. And so uh, principle uh, that is constantly seen in the word of God, in God's dealings with men, he acts not according to the apparent godliness of an individual, but he acts according to the true condition of their hearts. And so it's a lesson we still need to learn earnestly today. Why were they even there if their hearts were so divided? Why even bother to, to do this, to come and, and uh, seek counsel if their hearts were full of idolatry? Well, there could be different reasons. Uh, some people just love religious entertainment. And I just want you to look at Ezekiel 33 for a moment. Ezekiel 33, verse 31 and 32. It says, they come unto me, uh, unto thee, sorry, unto Ezekiel, as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. And it is interesting how people do seem to like religious entertainment. There are many people who go to uh, gospel music concerts, uh, things like that. There are people that are fascinated by eloquent preachers, and they would go and hear them. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, every time George Whitfield preached in the vicinity of Philadelphia, you could guarantee Benjamin Franklin would be there because he absolutely was enamored by the eloquence of George Whitfield, but no intention of ever doing anything with what he heard. And so uh, it's possible that people hang around Christianity and uh, have a, a liking for things of Christ, but their hearts, uh, because they, they they like, you know, I mean, uh, people like kind of this, this spiritual feel of things. I mean, you know, why do people visit uh, old cathedrals? Why do people go listen to Handel's Messiah? Why do people, because they like this kind of religious dimension of things, but in their hearts, they're millions of miles away from God. Just uh, what what is an idol today? Uh, well, First John five twenty one. Of course, we know it says last words of the great apostle John in that first epistle: "Little children, keep yourselves from idols." And we've said uh, an idol is anything that replaces God or the Lord Jesus in our affections and our obedience is an idol. Anything that replaces God and the Lord Jesus in our affections and in our obedience is certainly an idol. We're told to set apart Jesus Christ as Lord in our hearts. That's at 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Uh, and, of course, um, that's, that's the solution to idolatry, is the Lordship of Christ, set apart Jesus as Lord in your hearts. Notice again, we're still in verse three here, but it's such an important principle in verse. It says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart 
and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face, should I be inquired of at all by them. I want to just focus on this term stumbling block of their iniquity. And of course, it was idolatry. That was the stumbling block. They were just captivated by idols, and they had idols that, that were in their hearts. But I want you just to notice that this is it's a unique statement uh, to Ezekiel, and it is mentioned uh, frequently uh, in uh, the book of Ezekiel. And so let's just look at some of them, and um, we'll we'll just observe them. Uh, chapter here in chapter 14 verse 3 uh, notice again it's in verse 4 as well uh, again he says uh, speak to them say to them thus saith the lord god every man of the house of israel that sets up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face so we have it there uh, we have it in chapter 18 in verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God, repent and turn uh, yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall be your ruin. I guess that's not um, <laughs> what I was looking for. Uh, chapter 44, hopefully this one will come up, trumps, 44 and verse 12. Because the, they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to, to fall, fail, fall into iniquity. Therefore have I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, they shall bear their iniquity. So I, I guess the idea is that their, their idols, um, they had were a stumbling block of their iniquity in that it led to idolatry always leads to iniquity. There's a connection between idols and iniquity. And so uh, that's what it was, that was what was drawing them. But I want to just think for a minute on what is the stumbling block in our age and our generation? What is the stumbling block today? And really the stumbling block is Christ. And I want you just to see in First Peter, uh, certainly for the, for the Jewish people, he was the stumbling block. But for many, it's Christ. First uh, Peter 2, verse 7 and 8. It says this, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, wherefore also they were appointed. And I want to suggest to you that the real stumbling block for men today is Christ. And why is Christ the real stumbling block? Because, again, coming to Christ is a turning away from your iniquity. And so just like idolatry led towards iniquity, coming to Christ, you can't follow the one who is holy and perfect and righteous and continue on in your wicked ways. And so he, that is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Uh, the world uh, wants answers, uh, looking for answers, but it doesn't want Christ because you can't have Christ and continue on in your iniquity and your wicked ways. And so these elders who are coming to hear from God, and yet sadly, they're still hankering after their idolatry, which is still in their hearts. So God is going to answer them, but it's not the answer that they're expecting. Therefore, he says, verse 4, speak unto them and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. What does that mean? It means that 
his answer will be an answer of judgment. And that judgment will be based on the, the extent that they had given themselves over to their idols. It would be in accordance with their idolatry. And so God is going to answer them. And, um, of course, he's going to answer them in a very powerful way. Verse 5, it says, uh, that I may take, that word take is often used in the sense of seize the house of Israel in their own heart, because they're all estranged from me through their idols. And again, just uh, what, what a tremendous uh, issue idolatry is, because idolatry always destroys intimacy. It, if you, in your heart, feel a distance from God, it's usually because some idol has come into your heart between you and him. It causes estrangement. It robs of intimacy. And while ever we're involved in these things, uh, it, it's always the same result. It's always robs us of the enjoyment of intimacy with Christ. It, it estranges us from him. And we, so God told Ezekiel that the Jewish people had deserted him to follow after idols and that he would discipline them in order to recapture them. Uh, that's what he wants to do. He wants to take hold of them. He wants to seize them and capture them for himself. And so the discipline is going to be part of the idea of he's going to uh, take hold of them uh, so that they turn to him and are restored to him. And so he, the Lord wants that intimacy uh, and he, he wants that relationship with all of us. Again, just to, to refer to that word take, uh, it's, it's used in the sense of uh, various ways in scripture. Uh, it's used in uh, seizing prisoners. Uh, uh, it's used in various ways that uh, like that. First Samuel 15, 8, we won't turn up the references. First Kings 13, 4, or seizing an animal uh, that's captured uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 19, 4. Uh, it's used in conquest of a city to, to seize and take hold of a city, uh, taking hold of a rebellious son, uh, and uh, to have him stoned to death. It's used, seizing is always, it's used in that way in various occasions. So uh, again, the Lord's heart is for Israel to return to him. And so he's laying hold of those who have gone astray in their idolatry. And of course, his discipline, the whole point of his discipline is to restore this wayward nation back into a right relationship with him. Verse six, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Now this is the message that the false prophets and the false prophetesses refused to give. This is why they were so dangerous. They encouraged people to stay in their idolatry. That everything was going to be fine. God is not going to judge you. Just carry on the way you are. But the true message from God is this, that if your heart is away from God, the only recourse is genuine repentance. And so he says, uh, repent, turn from your idols, turn away your faces from all your abominations. And so through Ezekiel, God would speak to the elders based on the number of the idols <clears throat> they had in their hearts, and he would call them to genuine repentance. Now, of course, we've talked about this word repentance before. Uh, certainly the New Testament meaning of it is uh, to have another mind, change your mind which always results in a corresponding change of behavior. Uh, the, the Greek word is metanoia. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, so th that's the idea. It's a turning from your idols. So you change your mind about them. You, you don't see them as significant anymore. You see them for what they are. And in turning away from them, you on the other hand, you turn back to God, the one who they were estranged from. And um, part of God's long suffering is so that people will be brought to repentance. Uh, we know the passage well, but Second Peter three in verse nine is a powerful message. 
of why the Lord has not returned yet, why we're still here and not removed from the earth right now, is very simple. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. In other words, he's, he said, I'm going to come. He is going to come. But it says, is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the, the reason for the apparent delay in the coming of the Lord is to give opportunity for men to be brought to repentance. And even here, back in Ezekiel, uh, why had the glory of the Lord so hesitated, so delayed to leave, giving people opportunity to come to repentance? And even now at this late hour, a message is given, and the message is repent. <laughs> God still telling them, still pleading to them to repent. The book of Revelation chapter 2 shows the pertinence of this message. Some people say, oh, there's no repentance in the New Testament. Well, they're not reading their Bibles very well. And in fact, the message of repentance is given to believers, uh, the church at Ephesus. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. This is uh, Revelation 2 verse 5. Uh, he says, remember where you're fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of the place, except thou repent. And it's often been said, five out of the seven churches in Asia Minor have a message of repentance urged upon them. And their very uh, continuance as a testimony, as a lampstand for God, is dependent upon their repentance and their hearts being in the right place with God. And so, again, we started out asking some serious questions of ourselves this morning. Kind of easy to just look back and talk about these guys back in the days before the Babylonian captivity. But it's good to ask ourselves the question, where is our hearts? And would the Lord, if he had a message to our assembly, or maybe even to us individually, would that message include the world, repent? <laughs> would it say, you got to change your mind? You have allowed some idols to come back into your heart that didn't used to be there. And as a result of that, you've become estranged from me. You're not enjoying the closeness you once did. And so the Lord would say, repent <laughs> and turn your back on your idols, turn your back on the iniquity. And because again, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, Psalm 66, 18. And so this is the message. Now look at verse seven. It says, uh, for every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger, I want to focus our mind on the stranger there, that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart, putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. So not just the, the Israelite, but this message is to the prophet, the stranger, uh, the proselyte, the stranger that lived in Israel. Uh, also were bound by the covenant. Uh, we, we see that uh, in the Old Testament, that when they uh, became part of the commonwealth of Israel, they put themselves under that covenant uh, Leviticus 17, just to see this, uh, this principle. And of course, with it came the responsibility. But Leviticus 17, it says, the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak to Aaron, to the sons and to the children of Israel, say unto them, this is a thing which the Lord hath commanded saying, sorry, verse 10, and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, and or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among the people. So again, notice even the stranger. And so the thought is this, that um, 
The scope of the warning is not just to the Israelite, but also the stranger that sojourneth in Israel. And so the thought is this, that there's serious responsibility arising from association with God's people. The more a person associates with the people of God, the more light they come under and the more responsibility in proportion to the more privilege they enjoy is forced upon them. So the, the principle is this, light brings responsibility. More light, stricter judgment. So even the strangers, if they allowed this idolatry in their hearts, they would also, well, God would answer them. And it's a serious thing when God answers you directly, this ominous words. And so uh, our time is gone, but it's very sobering. I hope you sense the, the, how sobering this is uh, that we've been considering today. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to examine our hearts and ask the question, are we people that draw near with our lips, but in our hearts we're far from him because of idolatry that has estranged us from him? Are there things that we need to repent of? May the Lord search us and encourage us to respond and turn away from those things and turn back to him. Amen.